go. Um, thank you for joining the February 2022 MedEd Journal Club. And the topic today is relevant race and racism in medical school curriculum. And it really crosses the three continuums of undergraduate, graduate, and continuing professional development, because this topic is really foundational for all three aspects of the continuum and most aspects of the continuum at the same baseline foundation knowledge still. So we have not really climbed the ladder in this area. So I'm very happy to be presenting this with our two presenters, Julie Schwartzman Morris, who you could see her credentials, um, who's leading a very big effort in the Department of Medicine in her vice chair role. And Dr. Rob Roswell, who is in the Department of Cardiology as a cardiologist, but also an associate dean at the school. So thank you both for being here. Rob will be a discussant and Julie will be the presenter and all of you as participants um, listen and participate either verbally or in the chat. Okay, let's go. All right. So um, thank you, Dr. Frenari for this opportunity. And of course, thank you, uh, Rob Roswell, who um, for those of you who don't know is actually my friend of 20 years, which I figured out this weekend, 20 years. Um, so fortunately for me, he happens to be the exact right person for this role. Um, today, we are gonna be discussing a paper that was sent around titled Thinking with Two Brains, Student Perspectives on the Presentation of Race in the Preclinical Medical Education. Um, and fortunately, I was able to have some email communication with the lead and the final author on this paper. So I'll tell you about that. Um, but before we dive into the paper, just wanted to go over the learning objectives. So by the end of the session, you should be able to identify methods of teaching race in preclinical education, list three ways medical students may experience the presentation of race in various learning modalities, and discuss novel educational interventions um, to assuage concerns related to imprecise presentation of race in medical education. So my hope for this talk, which is really just gonna be scratching the surface to address the topics of race and racism in medical education um, are that everybody is present. Um, we have a productive hour. We feel that this is a brave space for open conversation. Um, and I appreciate all of you showing up and offering your vulnerability and truthfulness. And again, especially thanks to Rob Roswell and Alice. Um, so just, you know, uh, when I signed up for February, I don't remember, it was probably August. Um, I, I really thought it was a very long way away. Um, but we decided on this topic um, and it was really apropos because this is of course Black History Month. So I just wanted to put up the slide that was shown um, at the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds addressing Northwell's initiatives um, in equity briefly and presenting um, Dr. McCune Smith who was the first Black American to receive his medical degree in 1837. He actually was not admitted to medical school in the United States. He had to go to Scotland to earn his degree, but he did come back to New York um, and practice here and became a champion um, in his field. So just kind of a quick reference to that. Um, throughout this morning or afternoon, I guess, we'll be um, having some time for questions, um, but just the beginning and a little bit of the background, I wanted to address what does it mean to be a black medical student in the United States? Black Americans account for 13% of the US population, but only 6.2% of the graduates in 2018 to 2019 were black. Um, and this discrepancy really seems to reflect the fact that institutionalized racism um, is really still very prevalent um, and black students must really overcome much um, on their journey to medical school. Um, and obviously I'm speaking from this, from knowledge, from being an ally, from what I've learned, um, but I'm not going to pretend to understand the experience of what it's like to be a black medical student in the United States. Um, so trying to dive even further into that, 
um, this publication from the Doximity website looked and spoke to Black medical trainees um, on what they experienced during their medical education and how they felt um, as Black medical students using the words of token, um, choice, being victimized. One student said, it's very difficult to summarize my experience as a Black medical student. Being a medical trainee is daunting at baseline and in a lifetime of nuance and struggle that comes with bearing Black skin and it becomes unfathomable. Uh, basically also addressing the fact that because medic medicine exists on a moral high ground, it carries the false perception that it's infallible, but the institution has roots in racism. Many of the tools and practices employed today came to be via the exploitation of black enslaved bodies and medicine simultaneously centers whiteness as the norm and labels non-whiteness as a biological risk factor for disease. This is perpetuated despite the fact that there's no biological evidence of race for race is a social contract used to divide, oppress, and control. Um, another student talking about how possibly anti-racism teachings could be integrated or woven into the curriculum made reference to the fact that every time I read about a lesion being erythematous, I cringe. Racism is so entrenched in medicine that white skin is still the standard upon which we describe basic lesions. When I enter lecture halls and hospital workrooms, I'm quickly reminded how much whiteness is centered. I think about the structures used to maintain that whiteness and I instinctively hide my voice and try to blend in. I fear my authentic self will make those centered uncomfortable and I further internalize society's false message and I'm incapable that I truly don't belong. And then the double AMC addressed this on their website getting information directly from a female Black medical student of what her experience is like, was like in medical school and also on the, interview, on the interview trail. She said she entered the room of the, of the white professor that was interviewing her. And the first thing he said, the opening line was, ah, yes, Christy, I knew you'd be Black by your name. I froze, passing a half earned a smile across my face. So I just thought maybe if anyone had a reaction to this, we could take a minute. I know, again, we're just really scratching the surface today. It's one hour, it's the noon hour. Maybe you're having breakfast or lunch, but um, if anyone had any comments at any time, please put in the chat or please feel comfortable to share. Yeah, please feel comfortable to unmic and share. Anybody? Hello. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Leilani Martin. I have to say those excerpts, those were so on target. Uh, I, everything that they said, I can completely relate to. It, it's so true and, and it's the unspoken, you know, the way that all of the structures are built. So it is difficult in those spaces sometimes navigating and hearing these things that, you know, again, Medicine is presented as being, you know, there can be no mistakes, but, you know, you hear these things and you're in the audience and no one really clarifies, you know, oh, uh, if you're African American, you're going to have this, if you're this, you're going to have that. And then walking into spaces where you are the minority just already creates a, a dynamic that's uncomfortable. So what these individuals really express is, is definitely something I can relate to. Thank you. It's good to see you, Liliana. Thank you for being on. Anybody else? I saw Mike put yikes in the comment by, box with explanation points. So um. I think it's interesting uh, when she mentioned about the erythematous lesions. I was just talking to a patient before I came in here saying that I was going to go to this, uh, you know, journal conference thing about race. And, and she was telling me in her experience as a patient what she finds upsetting or even like I said, if you're a medical student, is that none of the images, the diagrams that we have in the, the textbooks represent people of color. She goes, yeah, it's nice to go to an OB office. You always see, you know, a white diagram with a white little baby. And then she goes, but she goes, she felt left out as a patient. But I, I would assume the same thing would go for, you know, clinical education. Thank you. Um, I see Matt has his hand up. It's actually Dave Tang. Hi, Alice, how are you? Great. I just, great. I, I wanna, 
applaud you for doing this one today. I, I really think it's, a, it's an important, obviously not only an important topic, but something we should also be just be able to free, freely discuss. But I, I wanna just acknowledge that the people who are actually writing this is incredibly uh, brave and incredibly descriptive. And, uh, and I'm kind of reflecting on our own students and I'm hoping that they actually feel that they are, uh, they feel comfortable to express them, you know, if they come up with come up against this sort of interaction and, and this sort of dialogue within, you know, Northwell and and within the halls of our hospitals. Thank you, thank you, and I want to tell you the fluke of this being Black History Month is really a fluke because it was like I'll take February, and I said great. So this is so apropos and I'm so pleased that we can be discussing something so important during Black History Month and bringing it front and center. So I'm gonna let Julie continue now and um, hopefully more dialogue, go ahead. Thank you, before I go on, I just wanted to see Rob, I couldn't tell if you were putting your hand up or no pressure. <laughs> no, 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 I wasn't putting my hand up, but I think, um, I think it's important to realize, and I think people are realizing this more and more, the reasons why all of this happened. It's not because the person who is interviewing that person is particularly malignant or bad. It's just that I think our society is just built on a pretty racist platform. And it's some people say, you know, we're always talking about racism. Why are we always talking about racism? And I think just to contextualize what Julie would go on and say is that we talk about it because it's the foundation of our country and it's the way it was built in terms of the structures and how it works, who gets interviewed, who gets educated in a certain way, who gets paid in a certain way. And so I think it's, it's not necessarily that person's fault. I'm glad that people are realizing this now, but I think it's really important to realize that we really stand on a long history of racism that just has this perpetuating effects that if we don't realize it and intervene, it's gonna to continue to cause disparities and inequities and contribute to climate, bad climate and bad health outcomes. So I just wanted to contextualize that as we listen to the rest of the, the presentation. Thank you, that's really an important point. Thank you so much. All right, so just doing a quick shift to from talking about racism um, in medical education to talk about race and the presentation of race and where talking about the concept of race may appear in medical education. Um, just as Rob was referring to, you know, this existence of structural racism in our country, um, we all know there's disparities in the quality of healthcare. Um, there is a known fact that there is implicit bias among physicians and there is a bias intrinsic in the design and operations of the healthcare institutions as Dr. Roswell was saying. Um, one report noted that a majority of US physicians may have an implicit bias favoring white over black Americans and a substantial number of medical students and trainees hold false beliefs about racial differences. Um, and this is both from when they enter and when they graduate from medical school citing that the overrepresentation of minorities as quote high risk creates an association between race and predeposition to disease and reinforcing the view that race, ethnicity, disparities, um, and I'm not using those two words, race and ethnicity as the same, just juxtaposed um, in healthcare are from innate racial differences. Um, and that can contribute to stigma and unequal treatment and it really seems that although some of us and some parts of society has grown to understand and reflect the understanding of race as a social construct, labels that are applied, not specifically a biological construct, that medical education itself has really not overall evolved to understand and upgraded the curriculum based on these different understandings of race and racism and health. Um, that there's significant variability within and across institutions in medical education and curriculum and the presentation of race. Um, and because of this, medical education as an institution really has to be put on the spot and evaluate how the construct of race is presented. 
Um, the presentation of race to medical students during the preclinical and clinical years may influence both beliefs and implicit biases and potentially influence our future clinical practices and further widen disparities in care um, if this isn't addressed. So the overarching principle of the study that I'm gonna to talk to you about is how may this impact the experience of medical students? And specifically, this, was a med this is a medical school right here. It's the Sophie Davis CUNY Medical School of Medicine um, where there's a large percentage of students of color and more than half students of our women, um, how may this impact the experience of students of color specifically? So we know that talking about a patient's race comes up in various contexts. You know, not only when you're talking about epidemiology or talking about social determinants, but a patient's race or race, race of a particular um, group may appear when students are sitting in lecture in small group discussions, when you're asked to write an HPI or write a note, a SOAP note. Um, race may come up on board examinations, when you're talking about PBLs and clinical rotations, when you're discussing risk factors for diseases, and then even still when making decisions about various therapeutics, sometimes race is assigned to a particular medication antihypertensive may be better for Blacks. You know, those are the ways that race comes up in this context. So my question to you is why or is including a patient's race in the opening statement of a presentation or documentation of an HPI problematic? Why might that become an issue? Or is it an issue? I think it's definitely an issue. I mean, I think it leads you down a whole pathway of biases, you know, when you say the person's white or black or whatever, you know, all of a sudden you're creating a differential diagnosis in your mind that may exclude things, you know, because many of us were trained, honestly, you know, to think of certain differential diagnosis in patients of, of different races. And I think that's the problem. It, it puts a lot of bias into it. Thank you. For I, com sure. I completely agree. Um, this is Pratichi. I'm a pediatric hospitalist at Cohen's. And um, just uh, two weeks ago, I took care of a, a baby who was three months old who came in with bruising. And I shared the story with a, a few folks on the call. But um, baby had gone through three physicians, their pediatrician, an ENT doctor, because they were pre-op for our procedure as well as one of our PEM you know, faculty had seen him in the emergency room. And this was a white baby of two police officers. And not one of the three doctors had mentioned non-accidental trauma as a possible um, etiology, or even just explained to the family that that workup may need to be pursued. Um, and when I took, you know, another emergency attending came in and then uh, you know, said, this is a three month old with unexplained bruising. Um, all of us pediatricians and most of us on the call know that that baby absolutely needs to have a non-accidental trauma workup unless you find, you know, a bleeding diathesis right away. Um, and the family was, you know, incredibly upset with that fourth doctor and then our subsequent team because all the other caring doctors were really worried about the baby's bruising. And all we were worried about was the, you know, was the um, potential for non-accidental trauma. I took this moment and I actually paused on rounds and I asked the, the, the residents to, to think about what had led to this moment where we were now you know, taking care of a family that was angry with us and all the biases and all the quote protective or, you know, right? The, the, some of these things were the biases of the, of the providers taking care of this patient potentially barred them from following what would be the normal practice for a three month old bruising. And I asked them, you know, if you were to substitute this baby's demographics with something else, how would this exact clinical scenario have played out in that pediatrician's office, in the ENT doctor's office, and in that initial emergency room visit. So um, I completely agree with um, the presentation of race, both you know, causing clouded judgment due to biases along the entire spectrum. Thank you for that. Sorry, go ahead, Rob. No, I always wonder if the issue is how we frame race or, or is the issue with us? And so the issue that was just brought up 
was that, you know, we thought of race at this particular family and went down a different pathway. And so is it, and then I think that happens when we see the patient anyway. And so does taking out race from the first line sort of put the band-aid and make us feel good. But then when we see the patient, we still do the same exact things. And so should we look at something and do something a little bit more deeper? Because I don't know, I mean, more deep, I don't know if, if taking away things out of the HPI or, or I don't think that's gonna address our implicit biases. It's, it might help, but when we see the patient, all of those implicit biases will just come running back in. So I wonder if these are sort of small steps and we need to think about it a little bit more deeply and in a larger context, because it just, it, it's difficult. And I think the other thing I would say really, really quickly, uh, being a part of the American Board of Internal Medicine is when you take race out of the identifier of that first line, it's hard for, let's say, us as ABIM question writers to test against biases and racism. So if you don't mention race at all, then you don't test to see if race affects something. For example, there's a lot of literature about withholding treatment because of race. And so if I say this is a 50-year-old person, a 50-year-old person, a 50-year-old white man who's come with chest pain for cardiac catheterization, and you know, the person clicks correct. And then somebody was supposed to like, this is a 50 year old black woman with the same symptoms. And then they wouldn't do that. And so if you take out race and say, this is in gender, this is a 50 year old person, then are you sort of being race blind when society still treats people according to race? And so I just put these thoughts out there that just to, again, say that it's complicated. And I think just merely taking it out sometimes, I think has us feel good but I don't think it really gets to the issue. And then sometimes thinking about race blind is also an issue. So let me stop there because I see Dr. Freeman has her hand up. I'm so curious, Rob, actually, since you sit on the ABIM and obviously I'm in medicine. So if, if you guys are wording questions this way, you say black man, white man, whatever, do you guys actually do data analysis behind those questions and change them in different years to different races to see if the differences in the way people answer the questions? That's a very, very astute question because we're actually with I suggested that since we do have that data, that we actually research it because the way you construct an exam is the way you should do it properly and appropriately is if you put in race, you should put in race all over. So you shouldn't right. put in just race for black. You should put in the amount of 50% of the exam should be white, Asian, Hispanic, black, et cetera. But the question is, if that same question were worded and it's a black person or an Asian person, does that change how you respond and answer the question? In society and in real practice, we know the answer is yes. Will that happen on an exam? And that's something that I propose that we study at, at ABIM because I think it does happen on the exam. It happens with our medical students. And I think if I, you know, if I were a black woman, I want someone to get that question wrong, who says to send me home, instead of saying to take me to cardiac catheterization or, or admitting me. But you can't do that unless you mention race, right? right? You, can't, you have to have it in the STEM to test against racial biases. So again, this is just, just to get to the, the, the tip of the iceberg of how complicated this is. And um, um, I, I think it's quite interesting. I think I see we have another question. I see Matt, your hand is up. I, I'm commandeering Matt's computer. Sorry, Jill. Um, no, I just I, I'm you know it's making me reflect on myself because I mean this is no truer than what we're dealing with now with COVID, right? I mean it's all over media, CDC, and what we teach about how underrepresented demographics are getting hit incredibly hard with COVID, um, whether it be morbidity and mortality. And those, in, in my mind, I'm trying to separate, is it me or is it what's, is it media or is it, is it, and how do I then perceive that? Because 
I, I see the point that you're bringing, Rob, about questions, and I, I think I agree. If you're going to do one question, you should do all of them, all of them, and lay, and put race into it. But I guess for me, I'm not sure it's that easy to take take it out of it from a medical point of view. But I'm saying that from my my individual construct, and I'm questioning whether it's me individually, and I need to reevaluate that, or is there some truth to that? Thank you for sharing that, I really appreciate it. Uh, Rebecca? Hi, um, thanks for this discussion. Um, I think, Rob, your point about making us feel better if we question learners when they are pre presenting to us and say, well, is that really important? Uh, you know, what, what you thought they looked like, right? Because I doubt that they asked the patient, are you African-American, are you Caribbean-American? I'm just gonna say that you are whatever I think you look like, right? Um, and I agree, it, it may make us feel better as teachers, but we, again, starting somewhere, um, I think is, is important. Um, and with regards to the, the test questions, right? Like we've been trained for so many years with so many tests that every, every nugget of information is a clue, right? To work in those algorithms in our brain. And in a way, isn't including race continuing to solidify those algorithms in our brain when, on the other hand, we're trying to get rid of those and saying that this is a social construct. It, disease patterns do not follow um, all these things we've been taught years ago. So um, it's it's such a complex issue, but but that that piece of everything in that short question is a clue to lead to the answer um, and continuing to use that, but then saying, but really, it, it shouldn't matter. I don't know. It's this dichotomy here. Yeah. So thank you that you you use the word dichotomy. The authors in this paper that we're going to get to use the phrase two brains, but that's really exactly uh, was very similar to the response of the students. So I'm just going to move forward. Yeah. Move um, forward. That would yeah. Be um, just briefly wanted to bring up another paper that Alice had showed me. Um, really, again along these same lines, the silent curriculum really just how it might feel to be a, a, a black or a student of color in medical school when these topics come up and are sort of just brought up without context and breezed over very quickly. Whenever the topic of racism itself came up, that really led to palpable discomfort in the room. Um, just like we were all saying, when studying for boards or taking boards questions, we learned the race might be a hint um, and that should be potentially, you know, a trigger for how to answer the question. But in the classroom, um, maybe it's culture and is there a context? So this is really just, again, another sort of subtle way that it was um, discussing the, the experience of a student um, in medical school. Um, recently, a paper was published in the New England Journal of Medicine where a group from Penn looked at almost 900 lectures from courses at their institution to assess how race was represented in this um, preclinical education. And they narrowed it down to making five domains in which educators misrepresent race. And I'm only bringing this up so that we could potentially understand how to use these groupings, which you've all really already addressed, um, to possibly make it better. One was semantics, again, using imprecise and non-biological labels, interchanging Black with Nigerian or African-American with Nigerian. Um, I ask my husband this question a lot because my husband is from Barbados and so he's West Indian, but people call him African-American and I, I've asked him myself many times and he says, I'm Black, just call me Black, you know? But mixing up these terms may lead to a mixed message and describing a Nigerian patient as African-American um, is actually incorrect. Again, so that's semantics. Prevalence without context, like someone said earlier, presenting the differences in diseases without contextualizing it. So just merely saying that Black patients have higher rates of X, Y, or Z disease without making assessment, without making notation of potential other reasons than just the fact that they're Black. Teaching students have uh, that Blacks have higher rates um, of readmission without any discussion of the underlying causes. So next subgroup, race-based diagnostic bias, presentation of links between racial groups and particular diseases. 
pathologizing race, the tendency to link minorities with increased disease burden without, again, contextualizing it. And finally, race-based clinical guidelines, teaching of guidelines that endorse the use of racial categories in the diagnosis and treatment of diseases, teaching students to use different first-line antihypertensives to black patients rather than whites without any exposure to literature that questions this, that could be misleading. So these were the five categories. So now we'll get to the paper itself. And again, I, I, this is, um, these are students at the Sophie Davis program um, right here in New York City. Um, I was able to communicate with Marcus Mosley, who is a potential medical student for this year. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about that conversation. So this was a qualitative research study. Um, they basically interviewed first and second year medical students, the majority of whom were non-white. They recruited them via email. The interviews, um, it was 22 people, ended up being interviewed by Marcus. Um, the research team included one black man, two Latinx women, one Asian woman, and one white woman. Those were the people who, after the interviews were completed, went through and coded and categorized in this qualitative uh, study. They looked at four main domains, how participants contextualize race, participants' exposure to the use of race in the classroom, how participants used race in their problem solving and learning experiences, and how participants envision using race in future clinical encounters once they become physicians. Their interviews and the questions that they asked, um, they said were framed within the critical race theory, looking at um, basically meaning research that explicitly names and considers the role of racism as a system of oppression. So, of oppression. so really embedded in the fact that there are racial disparities in health. Looking at medical education, reflecting racism in the US may be experienced in ways that reinforce notion that contribute to these processes that lead to disparities. Really trying to elucidate how what's going on in medical education in these preclinical years can contribute to continued bias in healthcare. Um, and one of the benefits in their opinion was that in this medical school, um, far compared to other medical schools, um, the, representation of BIPOC is significant above the nation's average. So as I mentioned, um, the lead author did all the interviews. There were 22 done. Each participant got a Metro card for $25 as reimbursement. Um, and then they, the four people on the paper went back and coded for comparisons, pulling out um, in that qualitative research analysis, these themes and narrowed it down to a few that we'll talk about. So at the last page of the paper, they show you an abridged guide to what the interviews were. Um, and I'll just read these really quick. Were you uncomfortable with the way race is being used or not in classes? Do you think the race of the teacher impacts the teacher's presentation of race in the classroom? Do you think the current curriculum adequately prepares you to use a patient's race in the right way or really what is the right way? Is there a right way? How would you characterize the level of precision of the presentation of race in your class or in your materials? When answering problems or doing problem-based learning units, how much attention do you pay to a patient's race? How do you know when the patient's, when the person's race is important? How do you know? Are you taught? Do you use race as a way to memorize diseases? Do you use it as a shortcut when answering questions? Do any of you think this is a problem? Do you think this is impacting biases? And finally, what do you think it means to use race the right way? Is there a right way to use it? How do you see yourself using race in the future? I think we've already discussed a lot of these and touched on a lot of these, but I would ask if anyone in the group has any other questions that you might've asked in this context, or do you think that these questions were appropriate or biased? Matt, I can't tell if your hand is up again or if it's just still up. <laughs> Sorry, no, I think it's still up. But we've just been like chatting in the background here with some of these, but um, just as a, a, a sort of reflection on your questions. Um, yeah, I, I think specifically we were talking about number two, which was talking about whether the presenter or the teacher um, affects um, how how these concepts are taught in a classroom. And, you know, I. I my my thought is like, is it so much the teacher or is it possibly our biases in receiving the information 
from the instructor um, depend, uh, does, that, does that differ um, in, in how the information is received from the two from two different teachers. I don't know. Um, because I, I, my, my, my colleague here that we were talking and my, my initial impression was yes, there's definitely a difference in how I've, I've been taught this in, in different ways from um, people who have experienced it versus people who are allies versus people who just sort of have a superficial understanding of it and are talking about it. Um, but then we were also talking about people who are allies who have very close ties and have experiences sort of secondhand that can very well um, relate to, to these experiences. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting um, prompt. It's an interesting thought. Um, that specifically is what we, we sort of got on a tangent as you were as you were presenting the others. Thank you. No, that's great. Um, you know, what is the right way? I think that that idea where you have the right way in, you know, little quotes here, you know, I think that's a, a very large elephant in the room, this right way, because I think if we asked everybody on this call to put into the chat, what is the right way? I think we'd all struggle because is there really one right way? Aren't it, it isn't, it has to be considered the right way for that moment in that discussion with that group. What do you, I mean, I'm looking at Rob for some guidance here. What can I say? What is the right way? So I, I think there is a right way. I don't think there's a perfect way, but I do think there's a right way. The right way is that the person who's presenting has to understand that race is a social political construct. And then you have to understand that if there is any association with ethnicity that is based on some sort of genetic sort of um, predisposition that you explain that. And so I always talk about transthyroidin amyloidosis. I did a lot of research on it and there's a, there's a mutation. That mutation comes from West Africa, Blacks in West Africa, and through slave trade, that mutation is really, it's highly prevalent in black, the Blacks in America and it causes heart failure. And so when you're explaining that, you have to explain that, you know, this is not saying that every Black person has it, and understanding that is just really following that gene from West Africa. Because if you went to London and checked somebody's heritage, let's say, who was from East Africa or South Africa, they wouldn't have that mutation. So really understanding where that mutation came from and how it helps us in terms of evaluating heart failure patients for Black Americans. And that's how you would explain it. And if you have something to do with you know, social determinants, you have to explain in terms of racism and structural racism. So you just have to understand what you're doing and how, what you're doing, how it relates to race and, and genetics, lack thereof, or social determinants of health. The last thing I would say is it's really important to look at race-based diagnostics and algorithms and figure out really why they're there and are they helping patients? Are they harming patients? A lot of the, 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 the discussion around BIDO, which is hydralazine and isosorbide for heart failure, was actually created because there was increased mortality in Blacks with heart failure. And so a Black heart failure physician and the Association of Black Cardiologists got together and tried to figure out why the subgroup analysis was causing so much more heart failure and death and morbidity and mortality, and then came up with that, that drug. And so just from my standpoint, pulling it away, does that mean that Blacks then do worse from heart failure? Because that's what the trials did show. And how do you, how do you balance that in the office? How do you have that conversation? And is it right or is it wrong? And I would say if I was a Black person with heart failure and there was a medication that was studied to be good for me, and you took that away from me so we could be sort of race blind, I would be upset because that means now my, my mortality is increased. And so <laughs> it, again, it gets very complicated. I think you have to just know the data, why you're doing things and apply it in the right way and discuss it. And I think that's really hard. And I lean a lot on the sociology folks and the cultural anthropology folks, but I think to do it right, you have to have that knowledge combined with the data from your specific field. 
whether it's in rheumatology, cardiology, endocrinology, and putting it all together. And then I think that's the right approach. So sorry for the long-winded answer, but I think it's really important. Thank you. Thank you for that answer, actually, because you very eloquently, um, uh, I think, explained something that I've been sort of processing and trying to put words to in the discussion about questions, um, because a lot, I mean, some of these risk factors, quote unquote, are, are there, and whether or not it's because of a biological predisposition due to race or due to something within societal uh, societal access or, uh, you know, a, a, or something due to our medical system, it is a risk factor in if for certain diseases um, on being a part of certain races or certain ethnicities. Um, and I think the way you just described it really, I think, hit the nail on the head for what I've been trying to figure out how, how to express in this discussion. So I appreciate that. Okay, I think we should move on yeah. just a little bit so we get to sure. some data. No problem. Great discussion. Yeah, this is great. And and by the way, everything that Rob um, just mentioned is also very explicit in the Zucker policy on discussion of race um, throughout the curriculum. So we will share those references. Um, so basically, the, these were the results. And again, like I mentioned, it was a qualitative study. So they really analyzed the 22 um, interviews and put it together. Um, they mentioned that multiple professors were teaching the same topic using different racial categories or different ways to name um, different categories, that racial categories in the classroom were often binary, so either white or black um, lumping Asian with East Asian, um, that the students were most aware of the presentation of race and board style questions versus lectures as we were talking about where if you saw it in a question on a board exam, then you thought it was specifically put there for your information as opposed to when it was maybe sort of briefly addressed in a lecture. Participants were divided on whether the race, age or country of origin of the teacher influenced the level of precision. So some said, Specifically, they felt that racial congruence was empowering if it was a black professor um, who was giving the lecture talking about black history or issues within the black race, that that might be more empowering. But others really said, as Rob was just saying, that it, it should be irrelevant and it's truly the teacher's responsibility to gain awareness. They noted specifically that the value of the presentation of race in various learning modalities was very different. Just again, like we were all discussing in problem-based learning where the purpose was really to understand the patient, get through the, the systems, go through the HPI in great detail, the race was maybe not as relevant. And they even mentioned that it seemed that in test questions where the race was used, it was far more often used um, specifically that the use of the word black of the race of a black race was came up more often um, than others. And in test questions, they did use it as a shortcut to get to the diagnosis. Students reported different mixed messages when dealing with standardized patients. Some said they were told always include race. Some said never use race. And this is all at the same medical school. This is 22 students in the same first and second year classes. Um, they weren't sure if when they were dealing with a standardized patient, they were supposed to ask the patient what their race was, or some of them said they felt more comfortable asking where their family is from. They noted there were lack of structured discussions on the benefits and disadvantages of using race, and that they really didn't have the skill set to apply epidemiological race-based statistics to clinical care. Um, so this concept of cognitive dissonance came up, this why am I thinking with two brains? And this is the title of the paper and the, the lead author told me they got this directly from a quote from one of the students interviewed. And cognitive dissonance is this mental conflict, it's distress where there's new information that contradicts what you already thought or these like two, the system of your beliefs is challenges or sort of a, the concept of um, a, a really poor way to analyze it or analogy is where someone is continuing to smoke because they enjoy smoking, but they know that cigarettes cause cancer. So that's sort of like where that divergence appears. And this one student said, when it comes to question problems, I feel like I pay attention to race because that's what I'm taught. That's what I see in books. But I know it's not an accurate way in real life. They know that in the real world that 
the race, first of all, may not be obvious. It may not be appropriate. It may not be available. And they're not, you're not to actually supposed to say, oh, this patient is Asian. They must have this. You'd look at the whole patient in the real world. So these are the two brains. This double consciousness also is used to refer to the fact that potentially students of color might feel very uncomfortable when race is presented in a classroom and either not contextualized or sort of mentioned briefly in a negative construct and then not elucidated. One student said, when you're facing statistics about you in a large lecture room and it's just being read off without empathy or sympathy for the fact that there are people in this room that you're telling us about ourselves and that's affecting us. For example, I mentioned the statistics on black women being more likely to have a miscarriage or more likely to die after childbirth, negative statistics. And the lecturer says something like that and just moves on. But meanwhile, as a black woman, I'm stuck in that I'm stuck. And that distress, that cognitive dissonance, the words are bouncing around in her head and, and after that, not able to pay attention. And as I mentioned, the author told me again, it was really that double consciousness, the disconnect of how marginalized students experience their own race in a very complex way, in contrast to the way it's presented in these preclinical years, with, which was felt to be reductive and made them uncomfortable. And then even more broadly, the disconnect again is using race as a shortcut for diseases, which as we know, it is no longer supposed to be thought of as a biological construct. It's no longer known that way, um, but that they should use race to exclude a diagnosis um, and use it in the whole summation of a patient, but that it's different when they interact with patients in the real world. So overall, the assessment was that you know, students experience race differently, race is used inconsistently and used differently depending on the context and context. And the student relied on the presentation of race uh, very differently depending on what learning environment it was, whether it was with a standardized patient, PBL, or in a test. And they struggled with the fact that they were aware of race whether biologic, what category it was, and, and medical education really should be at the forefront of better elucidating these concepts for students that we're putting out into practice. Uh, so some of the limitations, and then we'll go to discussion, um, which by the way, has been amazing so far. Um, concerned about confidentiality, they thought may have limited responses. Um, students with concerns about the presentation of race may have elected to participate. Um, but regardless, um, you know, the results of this study could potentially lead to the development of changing and changing medical, medical curriculum to alter that imprecision um, and improve the learning experience of students. Looking back at the five domains um, that I mentioned earlier, prevalence without context, race-based diagnostic bias, et cetera. Um, how do those of us here on this call or in this lecture think that we should potentially use this information or can we use this information to, to better use race um, in the curriculum? Absolutely. Uh, one example just from the reading was of the Pimo people and how basically um, it had been shown that they were suffering from diabetes at a disproportionate amount. But you, you, could, you could put it in the context of, oh, this you know, particular pe uh, group of people uh, have a high risk for diabetes and they make it seem like it's a genetic component or biological, but it wasn't. It was for the fact that they actually, due to their circumstances, were fed a diet that was full of food that was high in calories and non-nutritious things, and therefore they developed diabetes that way. I feel like in the same way, um, we can use something like this in education to kind of show students when we refer to certain populations, it's not biological because we're all the same biologically. It may have to do with things that are happening in the environment. Um, may, because again, when you study this particular group of people, they only have one case of diabetes, but when you altered their diet, it was something that ran rapid. So I think that's important. And um, also 
something when you brought out W.E.B. Du Bois' quote about the double consciousness, we do have a very important role in societies as educators because with the double consciousness, this is the sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others. So it's almost damaging when you're telling people these things that are not true about them. So that's one thing. And the other thing is we want to be factual and make sure that we're taking care of our patients and that we understand. So we really need to teach people that this biological, because I believe education has led people to think that when really it's not biological, a lot of it is environmental factors and we need to put that in education. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just want to mention that Wendy Herman, who's on, who's our trusted librarian, has put that there's a lib guide on um, addressing racism, promoting allyship in our Zucker School of Medicine library, and also a health equity lib guide that they have put together as um, knowledgeable librarians who know resources. So, um, and also there's an images of patients and skin color um, that are available as well. So this is great. Um, Thank um, you. Thanks, Wendy. Oh, absolutely. And just um, the resources that Debbie Rand had mentioned about the skin of color is also available in the Health Equity Lib Guide. So there's databases such as Visual DX and then a whole column of free um, ebooks that we have access to. Thank you. Yeah, so this is just the second table from that um, New England Journal paper, how to possibly reorganize it with those five paradigms, just like you were just talking about standardized language used to describe the race, avoiding imprecision, use categories that really reflect what diseases are coming from, not just the social constructed races, appropriately contextualizing and really providing evidence um, the author said that there, there's been no follow-up interviews, but what he did was help to work to, con to deconstruct one of the PBLs to change the word Hispanic to put in Mexican, um, also including in this one particular problem-based learning uh, unit that they changed, um, also included income status, immigration status, and childhood crowding exposure. Um, to look at the higher prevalence of H. pylori among Mexican Americans than non-Hispanic Blacks and whites, really sort of along the same lines of what Rob was talking about, really making it clear what the association is. You know, it's it's not just the race that it has been assigned by society. These are, you know, these underlying biologic associations, potentially like like Rob was saying. Um, so ultimately. As an institution, um, we need to really assess how we're presenting and instructing race. Um, this could potentially, if we if we really better educate our students and ourselves, most importantly, at least from the beginning, um, could potentially help to minimize false beliefs about race and minimize the experiences that potentially could be negative um, for students. And future research, really looking at what is the most appropriate format, or is there a more appropriate format to um, teach race? How does the composition of the faculty impact students? And what might medical education do to really mitigate the experience that students of color experience regarding race and racism? How can we best support our, all of our students? So these future directions and implications are just so important. And I'm sitting here and I know Wendy has her slides, but it's is one it's close to one. So I'm gonna let her go for a minute. And then I have so, a comment. So this one? Yes. Wendy, you wanna speak as quickly as possible? Yes, actually I think this could be a, a visual. So when everyone receives the PowerPoint, they can review it. Um, given that the discussion component is a bit more crucial than the bibliometrics at this point. Was this article widely seen though? I mean, it's just- uh, Yeah, so it had it did have a reach of um, followers uh, via Twitter um, of over 22,000, 20, over 22,500 followers. Um, it had two citations um, back to the article itself, which you can see on the screen here. Um, and then also 23 um, captures via Mendeley, which means that 23 individuals have saved um, this uh, article into their Mendeley library. And a majority of the, the people accessing the, the articles are from the US, Canada, uh, United States and Canada. So I'm gonna also just, I'll share with you, um, Alice and Wendy to distribute to everybody. 
Um, earlier this morning, I got a response from the last author on the paper about what has changed, if anything, at their medical school after this data. And she said, no major institutional change, but they put together a research poster to present um, about how changing the curriculum in the first two years by incorporating social determinants of health full curriculum could potentially also help to impact the experience of their students and the presentation and understanding of race um, in medicine. So I'll, I'll share that with you. She just sent me that data this morning, so I didn't have a chance to really review it, but I'll share it with everybody. And once again, everybody who came on today will get the slide deck and uh, of course feedback if you go to the next slide. The last slide, we're desperate um, for feedback. This was probably one of the most amazing journal clubs. Next month, I'm honoring my other profession in my prior life of nutrition and honoring National Nutrition Month, which is March versus Black History Month, which we're in. And we're um, gonna be talking about nutrition um, specifically in relation to cancer and the need for nutrition education in medical school. So diet and cancer implications. So that should be really interesting and um, feedback on the survey. But what I wanted to say, and could you put your main slide up because Wendy mind, reminded me, I wanna tweet this out because I think this is so Which wonderful. One? Your first slide. I just wanted to have that to take a picture of because I wanna tweet this out. Wendy reminded me of Twitter and I wanna tweet out how wonderful it is to have um, this group here today and tweet out because I think this is, you know, wishing the whole time I'm here, as usual, I'm always wishing who's not in the room with us, which is a terrible thing to be doing. But I spend most of my life doing that on most things I present, like who didn't show up. And I really, really think this is a great slide. Yeah, so this is great. So I'm thinking like this, this talk was so well prepared and so packaged that we have to get this message out. And there's the PA group and there's nurse practitioner group. All of them are doing this same work that we're trying to do clinically and need to have this as well as, of course, um, GME, CME, and, and um, undergraduate faculty. So if there's anybody you want to think about pushing this out to, please, please um, be in touch with Julie and Rob because they put together one of really the most powerful journal clubs I've seen in a long time and great participation. Any last words? Because we're just at one o'clock from anybody. You will get the articles and you will get um, this. So um, you will be endowed. I don't know what else to say. Thanks, I Alice, for, for bringing me into this group. And uh, obviously, huge well, thanks to- required uh, a yes to an email, you know, very simple. Alice sends her email and I got a yes. <laughs> yes, and great then discussion I today. Yes, and then I don't let a yes go away. That's the key. I remember the yes, so thank you. I put um, into the chat that there's uh, the latest uh, issue of Health Affairs, which you know, some of you may not regularly look at. Um, it's all on racism and health, all different aspects of articles. So you may want to check that out. Oh, that's really wonderful. Thanks, Debbie. And that's from our library, Health Affairs? Yeah, it's a journal called Health Affairs. It's one of the most popular journals uh, that we have, actually. Dr. Yacht, thank you for being here. I also just wanted to um, throw out that our program is talking with Dr. Jim Crawford, um, the head of the lab at Northwell, to try to remove the GFR African American versus GFR for all from Northwell. So if anyone's interested in participating, I know this is a probably group who may be interested, please um, reach out to me. I'll put my email in the chat. Okay, great. Rebecca, where are you from? Uh, Phelps, Phelps Family Medicine uh, Residency Program. I'm the program director there. You see, by Zoom, we reach far and wide to Northern Westchester, and we have our New York colleagues here. I know Dominique, so Dom's here, so that's great. So that's the purpose of Zoom. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. Have a great day, everyone. I'll see you next month, I hope. And once again, Rob and Julie, thank you. Great job, Julie. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.